Q video. Meeting will return to order. Good evening. Uh, this is Monday, March 20th, 2017, Mercer Island City Council meeting. We have completed an executive, we, we have uh, had an executive session, which we actually have not completed. We will return to that at the end of our regular meeting. Um, the the agenda has been amended to include a proclamation, which I will uh, read now. So this is a proclamation. Whereas America is a nation of immigrants and wave after wave of immigrants seeking a better life has built our nation and brought significant social, economic, and cultural benefits to communities nationwide. And whereas Mercer Island is, a, is such a community, as immigrants have enriched our city's culture, increased our productivity and innovation, and bolstered our economy. And whereas mayors in cities big and small, including Mercer Island, foster welcoming and secure cities for all their residents, regardless of who they are or where they come from, and whereas mayors across America have called on the federal government to enact comprehensive immigration reform and enforce the nation's immigration laws in a humane manner that does not disrupt the lives of city residents, and in the absence of federal immigration reform, mayors and their cities seek strategies to protect and secure all their residents while ensuring that local law enforcement enforcement is focused on community policing. And whereas the U.S. Conference of Mayors is organizing a National Immigration Day of Action on Tuesday, March 21st, led by Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, Chair of the United States Conference of Mayors, Latino Alliance, Anaheim Mayor Tom Tate and Providence Mayor Jorge Elorza, co-chairs of the USCM Immigration Reform Task Force, and Seattle Mayor Ed Murray, chair of the USCM Mayors and Police Chiefs Task Force. Now, therefore, it, therefore, be it resolved that the city of Mercer Island join cities across the country in proclaiming March 21, 2017, Cities Immigration Day of Action, and declares its sol solidarity with the immigration community and asserting its commitment to the values of diversity, inclusiveness, and equality. Approved this March 20th, 2017. And my apologies for that not being on the uh, agenda. It came to me late and uh, was something that I thought was appropriate for us to do and uh, I'm pleased that we're able to do that. Okay, we'll move now to appearances. This is the time when anybody may address the council on any issue they wish. You'll have three minutes. Please begin by introducing yourself, giving your address. Um, detailed rules of engagement are on the back door, but they really boil down to just please be civil. Welcome. Seventy fourth Avenue Southeast. Good to see you all. Um, just a couple things tonight. One is you guys are going to get an email from me later. I don't know um, if you've seen it yet, but um, all of the issues that we're facing on Mercer Island are really interconnected. The uh, single family home zoning, the town center density where we move forward and cut parking and uh, elevated some of the heights, and um, the school districts. And many years ago, Three years ago, before some of you were on the council, we talked about doing a demographic study. The school district just completed their demographic study. I've read the whole thing. I post a little bit about it on Nextdoor, but um, enrollments are up, class sizes are up. Um, there are some projections are in, that are in there, and as you probably know, the Mercer Island School District is facing a $3 million deficit. So some people say 2.1, but that counts in the donations that citizens make to the Mercer Island Schools Foundation. So um, I would strongly encourage you to look at this demographics report. I'll send it to you. I have a hard copy and an electronic copy, so you don't have to go through the website. But uh, one thing that Julie's done a really good job of is getting citizens engaged for the first time in, in the three or four years since I moved back to Mercer Island. And I would hope that you would continue the discourse. And I'm speaking for myself, not my PTA role, but um, actively pursue relationships with the school board to figure out what the impacts of the decisions that you're making relative to single family housing, zoning, uh, the neighborhood uh, build outs that are occurring. I know, Debbie, up in your neighborhood, it's 
gone crazy. Uh, and well, Dan, I guess you live there too, so you know better than most. But um, these are real issues and they're all interconnected and the population's growing. The second thing is, um, I, I did weigh in, um, even though I haven't been sp spending too much time on Nextdoor, but uh, the name change thing, I, I think there are some really good solutions out there rather than pushing that one forward. So Debbie, I just encourage you and the rest of the uh, team here to, to look beyond just the name change because uh, I think there are some ways that we can work to the solution that you're trying to drive towards. So thank you very much. Have a good night. And uh, I'll send this to you. But And I'd like to have conversations with each of you individually about this because um, education is very important to me and a lot of the families on the island. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Nancy Hewitt-Spaith, 8320 Southeast 34th Street. I'm just here to say that I am for the name change. Thank you. Love the brevity. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. My name is Michael Finn, and I live at 4024 85th Avenue Southeast on Mercer Island. And uh, I'm, I'm addressing this MyVol issue because it's kind of gotten overshadowed by all the I-90 stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm very concerned with that also. But um, <clears throat> I had a thought last night. I said to myself, when was the last time that you went to a big concrete building? and thought you were going to a park. And when was the last time somebody said, let's go to a park? And what did you expect to see? I'm thinking, uh, for me, and 90% of the people probably, they expect to see green, green, beautiful, green. And <clears throat> I love Mercerdale Park. Um, it's very well used. I think it's extremely important uh, with all the density that's occurred downtown growth and, and it's still growing that the people that live in this very dense, beautiful Mercer Island town center community have some green. And <clears throat> I took a photograph a year ago. I was standing over by the child's play area that's in the southeast corner of the park, and I'm looking northwest, and I'm looking at a beautiful patch of trees. And if you ever walked through there, I don't know if you ever have, but I have. I do it uh, from time to time when I go up in that that park and there's various types of trees there and um, <clears throat> so I would encourage you because uh, especially Debbie Bertolin you know when you campaigned initially you were save the parks I remember that distinctly so I want to encourage you to uh, keep our parks green and uh, I am a strong supporter of uh, Youth Theater Northwest. I was very upset that they were going to be kicked out of the uh, space where they were um, uh, w without any follow-on uh, plans. So um, I favor Youth Theater. I also favor Mercerdale Park Stain Green. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. My name is Will Knedlik. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Interstate 90 Users Coalition, and my mailing address is Box 99 Kirkland. I'm glad you're welcoming immigrants here tonight. Uh, I uh, originally appealed the East Link I-90 uh, EIS some years ago, uh, and we were not successful in that, but uh, I've asked the uh, 
Sound Transit Board of Directors, and I've provided copies of the testimony to you. It's a green sheet that's been distributed to you. Uh, to look at the need for a supplemental environmental impact statement based on the changes that are identified in the document uh, since the uh, action some years ago. Um, I would urge you, uh, as part of your litigation, and I know there is a couple of paragraphs in the litigation about the uh, environmental impact statement need for supplementation, uh, to look at the issues that have been identified because uh, there are very significant issues, some of which uh, are directly relevant to Mercer Island, others of which are not. Uh, but in particular, the very late breaking change in the, in the structural underpinnings of the project uh, when on uh, February 8th, I believe it was, they indicated that they're going to go back and completely re-engineer the bridge through post-tensioning uh, of the bridge facility dramatically changes the characteristics of the, the structure that will be there in ways that have real impact for all 5.7 million licensed drivers who are the beneficiaries of the state constitutional trust created exclusively for highway purposes by the 18th Amendment, but none more so than the people of this island who are dependent on the structural integrity of that. And with the post-tensioning, when you even more so than before, when you drop a 160,000 pound loaded light rail car onto a floating bridge structure, you are going to have separation of the rebar from the aggregate. These are going to be macro, micro fractures, but over the course of the 75 years of the lease term, you are going to be degrading uh, that, and you are also going to be flexing the internal rebar constantly in such a way that that's degraded as well. And what it translates into is the fact that you're going to substantially shorten the useful life of the bridge. That is not something that Sound Transit has looked at even before the post-tensioning, but the post-tensioning they now intend to do. After the fact, after dozens of years of study of how they're going to do this, uh, on February 8th they decide they're going to go back and restructure the whole thing. Uh, we know that ferro cement was a wonderful uh, kind of uh, uh, future for boating uh, in the 1950s. The food... Uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, wanted to build all sorts of fleets of ferro-cement boats. And within 15 years, that had all been dropped because the micro-fracturing as a boat goes through the water uh, and f receives the waves on the bow uh, destroys the ferro-cement in much the same way that dropping 160,000 pound rail cars and then flexing them back off are going to destroy the internal structure of the bridge. And so I would urge you to look at all the issues that are identified in these two pages and make sure that your attorneys evaluate whether or not they could usefully be part of the basis for which you can legitimately ask, not for an appendix, but for a genuine supplementation of the EIS that can give your city the best protections that's there. And if there's anything that I can do, because I've been studying this for quite a few years, to assist your city without charge, without fee, without desire for compensation of any kind, I hope your lawyers or your city manager will contact me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? And please, if there's anyone else, let's, uh, let's go ahead and queue up. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Buckley, uh, 15 Brook Bay. Um, I wanted to just speak briefly tonight and ask you again if um, the citizens can know where we are in working on safety concerns that we have and if, in fact, June 1st approaches and everything is shut down and R8A is implemented, um, what our EMS response times will look at like and if also we could have perhaps a an open public forum with our police chief and head of fire and safety and perhaps our 911 call center uh, just to help us understand uh, moving forward what it's going to look like for us here. And um, I hope that you understand it's kind of serious because a lot of us are considering moving 
So um, I really hope you take this seriously and that you get back um, to us with some answers on what this is going to look like if June 1st occurs and all of this uh, is performed and exits, entrance ramps are closed and two lanes of Federal Highway are closed for six plus years. So thank you and I hope that we hear back from you that you will be addressing these concerns for us. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, with that, I'll close. I, would like to. I wasn't going to, but I would like to. Thank you. All right. I'm Gary Robinson, 6026 East Mercer Way. And I didn't come tonight to uh, give you one of my little lecturettes about management. Well, maybe I did. <laughs> you know, they say when you're going through change, this is Price Waterhouse, Cooper said this, when you're going through change, the most important thing you can do to achieve that change is communicate, communicate, communicate. And I would like to ask that we have a more comprehensive communication of what is happening, particularly with I-90. I read all this stuff. I'm a reasonably intelligent guy. I should be able to understand it. But I must confess that in looking at what Scott Greenberg does one time, what the lawyers have done another time, what somebody else has done, I think there are four different things that are going on. And it is extraordinarily difficult to keep up with it all. Now, I know we have an overworked communication specialist, but I would ask that he dedicate himself to finding a way so that we as a community can understand, one, what all the issues are, and two, what action the council has taken to address those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. With that, I'll close public comment. Thank you. Uh, and we'll come to the consent calendar. We have payables, payroll, and minutes for the February 21st, March 6th, and March 9 meetings. Is there a motion? Uh, I, uh, Wendy, you wanted to pull an item. So yeah. let's, let's go ahead and do that first before we get a motion. So, so I'd like to pull the March 6 minutes. Okay, so we'll take the March 6 minutes separately after we deal with the rest of the consent calendar. Is there a motion to accept the consent calendar without the March 6? So moved. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Let's go to the March 6 minutes. Wendy? Yes. So on page 5, under AB 5263, about the Parks and Rec Department name change, I think the record should reflect that we discussed the matter and had a 3-3 decision. We didn't get to vote on that. Instead, we went to a 4-2 vote to postpone until all seven of us were present. I think that's a significant part of the procedure that um, has an impact on future potential actions we'll take in that regard. I'd like to see that reflected in the minutes. Uh, Allie, can you, I, I assume you probably were, you, you had a heads up on this. And yeah. I'm guessing you have, have some thoughts as to how you've, Right. Have done this. So we do action minutes, um, and so I recorded the actions. You did not vote on the first motion, even though each one of you stated what you would vote. Um, there was no actual call for the vote or a vote taken, so that is why not, the minutes do not reflect a 3-3. Three, three. Um, I did not put any statement in there regarding what each of you uh, wanted to do, because that's not the usual um, case for the minutes. And I didn't put any statement in regarding why the motion was made to postpone. I'm happy to add language if you would like, um, but I, I try to stay neutral and just do the action. Mm -hmm. So I didn't prepare language. I guess I'd like to just take a poll of the council and see if this is a point of interest and worth noting for the public record for now and forever. Okay. I mean, it, we, why, I don't understand why we would change, why we would change how we do minutes all of a sudden for an issue that you suddenly seem to have an interest in. 
I have an issue in the procedural change that we made because we knew it was going to be a 3-3 vote and didn't take the vote because the discussion took us down a path of postponing the vote. Right, because that's what we did. So I support the idea of changing the minutes because this it's a it's a record that will be impenetrable in the future without and it and it's going both to why it was tabled and it's going to this wrestling we are we are in the midst of with what our handling of tabling and the justification for tabling is so i for those reasons i i think it makes sense to have I, I mean, I don't care that it says who. I just would like it uh, to reflect that because of the um, uh, likelihood of a of a tie vote, uh, uh, a motion was made to table the topic, something to that effect. So that's, that's you got you got two, you got two opinions. You got two opinions. Let's get some more because we need to let's waste know, land, time land this. Time. Let's land this. Well, uh, I won't call anybody out. I'll look to others for who, who wants to wait on this because we're going to need to get to a consensus. Um, I'm happy to, to support changing the minutes. The thing that I was surprised to see is the minutes don't reflect, <clears throat> obviously it wasn't here, but they, they don't reflect the change in procedure that was agreed to. So maybe I missed how it was not a change. It, it wasn't. Uh, it, there was no official change of procedure. There was an action that was... Um, not common and that could reflect a precedent. Can, can I, I, because following that meeting, there was, there was obviously a lot of question about whether this was a change in procedure, change in process, et cetera. And so I shared with the council an email that I had sent to Julie, and that was that we were planning this meeting originally to have a study session on council rules and procedures and that you were going to be well first you confirmed a it did follow robert's rules of orders but clearly there's confusion on council and there's confusion in the community and i think that's super important that that gets cleared up so i think from a procedural perspective julie you're going to be providing us with a memo that would include more than but this issue as well is that correct just so we can understand the implications of what happened and then come back to the minutes right I, I, I'm going to provide you with a memo that includes your draft rules of procedure and obviously you all go by Robert's rules and I think in this case you were doing your best to follow the Robert's rules um, I, I do think there was an impression that you took a vote but you we've reviewed the tape we've reviewed everything and there really was no vote taken um so did you want me to actually get into more of the how you would do okay not right now i mean i, I think it's going to be important because I, you know this was one issue and this was a hot issue and i think for me what's important is that we're all clear on what the process would be going forward so that we don't have the same i call it tangled web for any other issue so but I, I don't feel the need to go into that here and now okay okay Jeff five seconds I support your wording Bruce I think the minutes need to show why we went to to this okay. Benson? yeah I'm okay with some elaboration but I think it is important to note that uh, you know that the discussion may have indicated a uh, three three, but I also I think it's important really to note that the Robert's rules of orders were followed. That's fair. Ditto to Benson. Okay. I think I hear Allie, if you could let's uh, I, I missed what you said, so I don't know. I was uh, to type. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um so what I had Suggest and when you're okay with where I was going, or are you do you want to advocate for something more complete? Uh, I mean, I guess I'm supportive of, of what I had said plus Benson's comments, which I was trying to be reflective of what you were what you were saying. Right. So I just want to be clear that under less. normal circumstances, and we knew it was going to be three three, the issue would have died. So if that's somehow reflected in typical Robert's rules of order, that would be great. That's not uh, that's I'm, not an accurate statement. 
I'm not sure if we can actually go that far because we never took a vote. We don't know how the actual vote would have actually turned out. And, and so I'm not sure if I could go that further step. I mean, so. Okay. This, this is like the I'm Mike Ciro way of doing minutes that we all, okay. we all grew to love. Okay, so <laughs> just let's stick with the issue. I'm happy to keep it at the higher level then and we'll proceed and we'll give more attention to both of them. So Allie, the minutes, if it, uh, somebody uh, throw me overboard if, I'm, if I've got this wrong, but the minutes would reflect that the council appeared to be reaching an impasse uh, or, a, or a tie vote, and the um, in, in, in light of that, uh, Council Member Grouse I mean, voted to table the motion or move to, to table the motion. Move to table the motion. So, which was consistent? Yeah, which is consistent with Robert. Carrie, you got. Going to help me out here? Well, or, technical point I feel compelled to mention is um, move to table is not actually the correct styling of the motion, but as reflected in the agenda bill, tabling is when you interrupt regular business for an emergent, urgent item. So, what we understood the motion or how we interpreted it is a motion to postpone to a time certain, which was the next regular meeting. That was articulated and that did happen, and there was never a vote taken on the underlying main motion. So that is consistent with Robert's rules of order. <laughs> so so we sort of followed Robert's rules of order with different terms okay. from what it was. So yeah, so we're comfortable with Ali phrasing it the way Carrie has proposed. I think Ali and I can accurately yeah. capture this in the minutes. Very good. Let's bring it back for our next meeting then. Yeah, actually, it'd be good if we could approve these. Approve yeah, approve as amended. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's fine. So, okay. if you could, you if someone could make the motion. So, I move that we approve these minutes as amended. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to regular business then. Uh, Agenda Bill Five Two Seven Four I ninety Loss of Mobility Negotiation Status Report. City Manager Julie Underwood. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, <laughs> So, um, some updates for you on I-90. Um, first, I thought it might be helpful to really provide more, more of a litigation overview. And um, I'm going to look to uh, Carrie to interject when she might be able to help clarify. To the public, I think it's fair to... I, I thought that last public comment was really spot on. This is a pretty complicated issue and it's involving a number of different parties and it's involving a number of different approaches and strategies. So, but first let's cover the litigation. It's, it's where the city's focus is primarily at the moment. In fact, there are three lawsuits. One is a lawsuit initiated by the city of Mercer Island where we are claiming breach of contract and other claims against WashDOT and Sound Transit. And then there are two other lawsuits. One of those is a, a lawsuit initiated by Sound Transit where they are compelling the city to withdraw the suspension of the shoreline substantial development permit and to process the building permit. And then third, it's a lawsuit that WashDOT and Sound Transit initiated to strike down our moratoria. So that's kind of the big litigation overview. Um, so Mercer Island initiated. So um, as I mentioned, this is our claim of breach of contract. At the moment, discovery is underway. So that's where we go through a process working with Sound Transit and Washot to um, really request records and information. And that's the process we're under right now. And there is no hearing date set for that. 
um, sound transit. This is the one where we um, suspended the shoreline permit and also more or less suspended the building permit. There was a March 10th hearing. Um, sound Transit committed at that hearing that there is no work happening in the shoreline until mid-June. They also uh, noted that a SEPA addendum for the East Link project will be issued very soon. And by that, I mean, I, th I think it was indicated within the week, within the month, something to that effect. So the city, we are waiting that addendum and, um, and look forward, obviously, to reviewing that. Since they noted that, we decided to withdraw the suspension of the permit. Um, and partly it is because they noted that the addendum is coming and then they're they're basically not even doing any work on the shoreline. So we decided to do that and we'll evaluate the addendum when, when it comes to us and we will determine whether or not we need to take any further action on the shoreline permit. It's quite possible we will. Um, I think that, uh, again, remains to be seen until we actually see um, what the addendum looks like. There is a hearing set for that, and that hearing was April 7th. I think initially it was um, March 31st. Yes, Carrie. I was just going to flesh out um, that last point about the addendum a little bit more to say that um, we expect that addendum to identify changes in the project that are creating new impacts and to also identify mitigation measures that Sound Transit is proposing to address those impacts caused by project changes. So that's what we are particularly going to be evaluating. Um, so I just wanted to, to note that. On the third lawsuit, um, so they want, of course, the judge to strike down the moratoria. The application for writ is due in a couple days, so this is where we're expecting um, Sound Transit and Washdot to prepare that, and a hearing is set for April 13th on that. Um, so we continue to meet with various citizen advisors. We had a meeting um, a couple weeks ago. I'll be looking at doing that again with some other residents who are really active and involved on this issue. Um, we continue to find opportunities to present our story. Uh, I attended the East Side Transportation Association meeting last week. I'm invited to attend the Mercer Island PTA Advocacy Group. I'm looking forward to meeting with them on the 31st. And then obviously keeping residents informed is our number one issue. It, it is a challenge because it is very complicated. Um, but I am looking at finding other ways to keep our residents informed I'm just trying to, um, it change, the, the issue changes so much and so quickly, I'm really trying to work with our consultants um, to identify what's the best approach and what should we be communicating. Um, and obviously being able to uh, point people to the website, to our electronic media is helpful because that can be updated much more frequently. So um, I urge our residents to check out our website. Information is there. Um, usually if you go to our front, um, front page, you will see a really, a, I think, a pretty good what's happened. You know, so in fact, when we did withdraw sus our suspension last week, we got that out on our website and wanted to make our residents um, aware of that. And unfortunately, I can't really get into too many details around the litigation as, as wanting to protect privileged confidential information and not reveal our legal strategy for obvious reasons. So I apologize that I'm not able to really provide more than that. Um, and, and so, counsel, if you have any questions and thoughts for me, and I do plan to host... Um, Elizabeth mentioned this, and I'm glad she did, do plan to um, host a meeting around public safety. I'm just trying to, again, work with getting some advice from our advisors and also working with our um, chiefs to 
time that right. So, but definitely we're hearing from our residents it's a concern, emergency, emergency response, safety, um, and it's our chief's concerns too. So any questions? Ready? So Julie, do we have any updates on when the South Bellevue Park and Ride is going to close and what changes there might be to the 550 bus route stops and any of that kind of operational stuff for mm -hmm. Ride? No, and I know um, Kirsten reached out to Sand Transit last week to try to get them to again come out to address some of these questions that you and many of our residents have as well, and they haven't committed to that. But we haven't heard... Um, and I know Claudia promised to get some more information on that too. So we'll continue to work with Claudia and with Sound Transit to try to see if we can't get more specific information. Mm -hmm. So just a clarifying question on top of Wendy's. So they they won't commit to coming or they won't commit to a specific date? Date. That's it. Uh, Julie, I'm not sure if this is for you or maybe for the city attorney, but uh, let's just assume that the addendum, we actually receive it and we have, you know, we don't necessarily agree with their conclusions that are uh, raised in the addendum. Can you just talk about the process? I mean, if we are going to question it or what is that process? Um, maybe Carrie can. Um, Council Member Wong, um, we have uh, several options under SEPA, and one of the options is to rescind the permit. And so if we feel that's warranted based on whatever is stated in the addendum, then that is an option that we can consider. So I can't commit at this time. Obviously, we haven't seen the addendum, so it's a wait and see, but that is an option. Other questions? Seeing none. Julie, thank you very Thanks. much. All right. Uh, there's no action on this agenda bill, so we'll go ahead and move, move on to agenda bill 5271, consider parks and recreation name change. We've been here before. We're here again. We alluded to it in our minutes. Here we go. Um, Bruce Fletcher, your name appears here. So. Yes. You are our man. Good evening. Bruce Fletcher, Director of Parks and Recreation. And speaking of Parks and Recreation and being healthy, the Rotary Run was yesterday, and Councilmember Wong did the 10K, and Julie and Carrie did the 5K, and we're all still walking, so that's good. Excellent. I did the half. I'm barely walking. <laughs> At the March 6th Council meeting, I was asked by the city council for, uh, or asked the city council for direction regarding the parks and recreation name change. As stated in the agenda bill 5263, the original council direction was to come, be come back with a name that included the arts. I presented a few options and parks, arts and recreation department had the most interest. As stated in the agenda bill, a slow rollout phase in a new name would have minimal uh, budget impacts and the agenda bill itself had no budget appropriation request It was my understanding that the intention was to postpone the main motion of tonight until tonight's meeting So I'm just here asking um, To bring up the discussion again on the main motion to provide the Parks and Recreation director me on the name change um, of the proposed Mercer Island Parks Arts and Recreation Department. So I'll let you guys have the discussion. I'll be here to answer any questions that I can. All right, very good. Thank you. So let's go questions for Bruce first, and then we'll obviously most of this is about us uh, figuring ourselves out, but questions for Bruce before we so go. So for there. Dave's benefit, could you um, remind us what the staff recommendation is and the many programs and services and residents your department serves? Um, yeah, we, 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 we have a lot of programs through the Parks and Recreation Department, of course, and arts has been a long storied history on this island. Um, we did a few things, and one of the things um, I was asked to do, or maybe I just did myself, was survey, survey, my, survey my staff because I wanted to find out, number one, did they have any ideas of unique names with arts? And we got a lot of different variations, and if they supported changing a name. And they didn't... They, they they supported keeping the name the same and knowing that we have a lot of arts in it. So that's how the staff came out. Other questions for Bruce? 
Okay, seeing none. I'm not sure where we're going to go on this, whether we're going to get a motion to start. Obviously, where things were left. Debbie, if you want to go ahead and launch us, feel free. The there's okay, uh, so, yeah, yeah, there's help. a motion on the table. Okay, so, so the motion, yeah, the motion on the table is to provide direction to the Parks and Rec Director to change the name from Parks and Recreation to Parks, Arts, and Recreation Department. So that okay. is the, the motion on the table. Now I've got to figure out what that exactly means. But anyway, so... so and forgive me. Yeah. So we just launch into discussion then on the, the existing motion. Okay. Okay. So, so this is... Okay. That, that's good to know. So, wow, is all I can say. Um, when I originally raised this with council last June, the intent was to highlight, in my mind, the importance of arts in our community and equally the importance of putting a spotlight on the services and potentially the funding that went with it. It was great to have the support of at least three other council members. The discussion was around, well, what would that name be? At no point was there a recommendation, and as the director just confirmed, to do any sort of speedy rollout and or incur any significant expense and or any great unnatural behavior in the in the rollout. It also came up at the same time as a discussion on changing the utility department to public works. So for the community to understand, the name of the utility department actually went ahead and changed to public works. And that rollout is underway. And as far as I'm aware, there's no significant expense it's been incurred, et cetera, changing letterhead, et cetera. So when, when it came up again um, a couple weeks ago, my intent was really the same, and that was to resurface what I considered to be the importance of art and a conversation. Ironically or intentionally, I don't know. It also happened just following a discussion on changing the name of the sculpture park, um, which received, I believe, unanimous support, again, with the understanding there'd be no significant expense or, or disruption. What subsequently came out, which you know has been interesting to me, a little bit disappointing, is a focus on the conversation of the expense, which as far as I understand was not the intent of the department, and it was certainly not mine. So with that, I, I don't know if I, what I do at this point, I don't intend to re-raise it, but what I would like to do is to go back to the original reasons why I brought this up. And it goes back to a number of issues. I went back, I spent time, I stopped after going through the last five biennium budgets. In none of the biennium budgets over the last 10 years was there a single arts capital improvement project that was funded or unfunded. I stopped at 10 years because it seemed to kind of be enough. I raised um, the issue of a list, a draft list of potential capital projects two weeks ago to further elaborate on my point. There's over 30 projects on that list that was put together across all departments in the city for a total of $16.8 million. Again, very loose, just a rough draft. Only two of them were on that list, two of over 30, and they were priority two and priority three. And so I'm back here today saying, to me, the point is not the change in the department name. The point here is about drawing attention, I hope, of this council, of our city staff, and of our community to the importance of the arts. And sort of the the exclamation point on this for me was the release of the President's budget document last week in which it cuts over $970 million from departments such as the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, i.e. Big Bird, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services irrespective of the name of the department, I hope this community will stand strong and support the arts programs, be it through Parks and Rec, be it through any number of programs. So with that, I do have an ask, but it's a part and separate from the motion, so I would hold off on that ask until we 
resolve the issue that's on the table. Okay, others? Benson, then Dan. You know, one thing that uh, obviously this has generated a lot of um, passion, a lot of, uh, we've received a lot of emails on this issue. I, I just, again, make it quite clear that nobody on the council uh, was advocating for spending $60,000. I, I think uh, that would have been fiscally, uh, you know, unwise and uh, foolish. And so, uh, again, nobody was advocating for that. I think one thing that actually has been, better, been very beneficial as a result of this uh, discussion is that um, it's quite clear that uh, the community is quite passionate about arts. Uh, how you basically um, uh, show that uh, passion and that uh, value, I guess that's really the question that we are struggling with. The um, uh, question is, do you incorporate it in the name of the department or, or, or whatever? But uh, I, I was actually very pleased by the fact that, uh, again, we have uh, the, com the entire community basically in support of the arts. And so, you know, going forward, I know uh, Deputy Mayor Bertwin just mentioned uh, the capital improvements uh, program that we look at every year. So I think certainly for me and hopefully for the other members of the council, I think as we go through these uh, review of the CIP that we, you know, look at these projects with different lenses, not just, you know, necessarily athletics, but also uh, with the eye towards arts and how that might, uh, how we might be able to enhance and improve our, our programs that are available uh, in that regard. So I, I think it has proved to be a very valuable exercise, sometimes a little painful, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's important. Dan? Yeah, I, I think it has been painful, and, it, and it's, it's very frustratingly painful because I think that I would have hoped that that city staff as a matter of communications would have done something early on when this idea of $60,000 kept getting circulated because that number originated with city staff and, and once the council had talked through it last time I would have hoped that city staff would have jumped on that and, and made it clear to the public that we weren't talking about spending $60,000 but that didn't happen so we've gone through almost two weeks of the public haranguing us and rightfully so, because they were led to believe that it was going to cost 60000 The council was actually voting to spend that money, and that was never part of the motion. But so be it. That, that's where we're at right now. I think the other part that's been a little bit distressing is this notion that we're incapable of multitasking, and therefore we should spend every waking hour doing nothing but I-90. And I'm sure when we get to Agenda Bill 5270, which is coming up next, no one's going to make that argument to say that we shouldn't be talking about correcting our code on identification because we're incapable of multitasking. Um, we are obviously capable of multitasking and because we have to do it every day. We're running the city with our city staff and, and we have to keep other things going forward. And this will be not the, the last time that we have an agenda bill which doesn't happen to have I-90 emblazoned across it. So we have to be willing to take on more things than one. But I think that the most important part of this thing is, is you know, what we do as a council is recognize what's important to this community. And, and we do it in, in very different ways. Um, but I think the reason that Debbie started this and the reason I, I've been supportive from the outset is that arts really defines Mercer Island. It really, it really does, and, and particularly in our school system in our in our parks programs right now arts is a critical part of it we have an arts council which is one of the most active citizens groups on the island and and it is it is i so firmly believe that recognizing the value of the arts just like we recognize the value of parks you know we're we're going to be asked by some council members, I'm sure, in the next few weeks, to spend several hundred thousand dollars more on turf fields because athletics are really important. And it's really critical that we make sure we can support our athletic programs. So we're going to be asked to spend a few hundred thousand dollars more than we even budgeted because that's really important. Well, I would suggest to you that the arts are really important also. 
And for us to do what I think is the most nominal thing right now, to say to the community, we recognize that not just athletics are important, we also recognize that the arts are important. And we're doing that by saying that we have a department in this city which a critical part of their mission is to support the arts, and we want to recognize that. And you know, to, to say that that is that's irresponsible or that that's off ta- that we shouldn't be doing that or somehow that's inappropriate. I I, I just I don't get it, and I, I would hope that we can get beyond this and, and recognize that the arts makes a difference in this community, and we as a council are not creating some doing some grievous harm by actually acknowledging that. I'll take a turn if you want to go. I'll take a turn here. So. Uh, first, I, Benson, I, I like your interpretation of the email we've been receiving, that it, that it says our community loves the arts. Um, I didn't quite read it that way myself. Um, it <laughs> seemed like there was an awful lot of, uh, I don't support the change, don't waste the money, and uh, focus on I-90. That was more That's, directed at us, I think. Okay. I, I, th- I think this is one of those cases where... Uh, we as a council, and I've, I've said this many times about different things, we have to think of all 23, 24,000 people, not of the group that has organized the latest letter writing campaign. And, and I believe that this community um, as a whole does care about the arts. Uh, so I, I agree with your conclusion. I don't quite agree with how you got there. Um, but I, I believe that the arts do matter a great deal to this community and should. Um, however, I think this name change has become a proxy for uh, MICA, the, the d- MICA debate, and a proxy for uh, the, the f- focus or not of the council on I-90. Um, and so what I would suggest we do, and I don't, don't know whether we actually go there, but, but my suggestion would be set the name change aside. Forget about the name change. Let's instead think about what the underlying actions we're taking are that get us to um, supporting the arts to the degree that we believe they should be supported. And, and so that becomes, to my mind, a conversation perhaps at the mini planning session about how we prioritize, or, or perhaps it was, it's, it's within the context of this levy lid lift conversation that's going to, going to be occurring in the fall, I think. Um, but it's a conversation about how you make sure that your priorities match what you, you believe to be the case for the community and how your budgeting and, and uh, money uh, allocations match your priorities. And that's, to my mind, the, the the place where we can make the real impact here. And so what I would like us to do is, is um, uh, again, forget about the name change. It's become a third rail issue uh, it, at the end of the day is, is not the real issue. The real issue is, is what are we going to do to fund things and, and make sure that the priorities are showing up in our, in our actions there. Again, I, uh, that's my thought, um, but it's it's only a thought right now, and others should wade in, and we'll figure out, following Robert's rules of order as best we can, how we how we actually land this somehow. Wendy, to you. So, I'm just going to rehash what I said last time and um, start with the question of what is the problem we're trying to solve. I agree, the arts are important. We have a robust arts program through our city, through our schools, through our nonprofits that are here on the island. I, I don't think this is a problem that needed to rise to a priority of government when we have so many other priorities. I think the staff didn't want it. I think our community doesn't want it. I think recreation includes arts, includes seniors, include, includes cultural programming. I think the name change itself is not eloquent. Parks, Arts, and Rec doesn't roll off the tongue. We made that point. And I'd also like to ask where the public engagement is in this. This seemed like an idea brought forth by a couple of council members without enough feedback from the count, from the community other than when we sort of let them know we were talking about it and we got a vociferous response not to. Um, I think the optics around Mike are significant. I think that's a, a difficult issue that our community is grappling with at the same time we're grappling with I-90 and single-family residential. 
I just I really am concerned about this being another wedge in our community. I don't think it needs to be. I'm sorry it is. And regarding the, the parks turf project that might be coming up in a while, that's one that has a $500,000 RCO grant riding on it and a timeline. So I don't think it's fair to tie those two together. And finally, regarding the $60,000, it costs money to change signs. It costs money to change letterhead, logos, websites. You need somebody to design that. You need somebody to figure out how to communicate that. It's not a no-cost proposition here. It's a significant impact, and if you roll it out over time, you drag that painful rebranding out over time and confuse people while they're answering the phone and seeing different signs and wearing different shirts and different posters. I think we need to take the vote now to put this thing to bed once and for all. Jeff? Yeah, I, 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 again, I'm following Wendy and will agree with her um, that we should take the vote. I mean, because the proposal was to change the name, we should vote on that. I'm strongly supportive of us discussing um, the arts at some point and funding for various projects. Um, again, I think that's where the meat is, but there is a proposal on the table and that we should vote it on it. I mean, in terms of funding and when we need extra funding, perception is reality. And when the public is looking at us, they're looking at how we operate and how we uh, do business around here and what we focus our time and attention on. We're going to want it, need, probably need to go to the community uh, to get additional funding, partly for the arts. And we need the faith of the community that we are, you know, focusing on the right things. I do think that the money would need to be spent at some point. I mean, a middle solution of a slow rollout means a slow impact. So why do it? And if you're going to do it, you do it right. And that means spending the money. But we don't have the money. And uh, I'm also concerned in the timing with the perception of a sizable group of people that, you know, with Micah and SEPA review uh, at the council, now is not the time to, to stir that hornet's net up with our community who we want to have those uh, see uh, what we're doing. We've already spent five times the amount of time than we did on the I-90 update. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to ask that we vote on this, and I'm going to vote against this, this change. Dave, you haven't had a go. Debbie's asking for one. You guys figure out between yourselves. I think there's there's a couple points that I want to respond to. So so Wendy asked what's the problem, and I think you know that's been highlighted a few point, times over insofar as there have been no capital projects for over 10 years. Two of 30 plus projects were on there with priority two, priority three, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, again, just to reiterate, was the problem. The second one is public engagement. We didn't have any public engagement around the public works name change. So in some senses, if we were to go parity, then we should probably roll back the public works name and go through that. But I don't think anybody's recommending that. And the, the final point here is Micah. And, I, and I, I have to thank Bruce for bringing it up, because I really do think that that is the, the elephant in the room, the hornet's nest, and all that other stuff. I think, Julie, when we go to the scheduling, the planning calendar at the end, it would be helpful to get a general sense of what's next. I don't, I don't mean what's I mean, on, on the calendar, when do we anticipate or when could you come back and let us know what's going on? Because it has been quiet for a very long time. And I think it's in that quiet that there is a lot of stress, a lot of concern, and equally the potential for accurate or inaccurate information to come out. So I think that would be important. So again, you know, I, I do not want the name change to be the lightning rod here. What I really want to be the lightning rod, and in the event that I'm not going to be able to get to it tonight, I'm going to say, if I wait another turn, I'm going to say, my ask, my ask tonight is quite specific. There was a lot of interest in what that list was, the capital list. Let's get that posted on the website with all the clarity that Julie and staff have provided several people as to how that list was put together so that there's really clear understanding that it was drafty draft brainstorming stuff. The second thing is I would like the Arts Council to take a look at that list and I would like the Arts Council to have the specific opportunity to weigh in as to any additions that they might have on that list. Equally, I think any citizen, any resident should be able to weigh in on that list. And keep in mind, this is things, there are asks on that list that range from IT to parks to 
to all kinds of stuff. So it's not purely a, a parks and rec list that's there. And the final thing is, um, and I'm happy to do this in conjunction with staff or with any other council or community members, is a review of the spending from the city on the 1% for the arts to really take a look at where that funding has gone to see if past practices are the practices of the future or when we do get to budgeting and prioritization discussions if there isn't some opportunity there. So those are the asks that I have. I'm, we do need to get through this vote. Um, but again, I, my biggest thing here is let's make sure that, you know, the, the information's out there in the public that is accurate. Thank you. Dave, this uh, topic was not tabled but carried Oops. over because uh, <laughs> everyone knew that you would be the sage. Uh, don't don't know that anyone said those words ever, Bruce. Um, I, I'll say what I think the council feels and the public feels. That I think we've spent oh too much time on this already. Um, and I think everybody would like it dispensed with. So I would say let's just move to a vote. Um, for me, for me, does one more person join yoga class because we changed the name, or does one more kid get introduced to parks or to uh, the arts because we changed the name? I'm not sure that they do, and I think that while there, you know, we didn't do a great job at talking about what the cost would be and how that would work, and I think. Uh, people became alarmed at a at a fairly large number, which in you know I think to most of us we are facing a, a potentially unlimited legal bill, and so this is not the time where we we bite off new new expenses. Um, so to me, it feels like we're not we're not changing the nature of the island. We're not serving the residents any differently. And I think there is a, an expense that we go through, whether it's incrementally over time, um, because websites do take designers and, um, you know, signs do take manufacturing. And um, so I think there is a cost. So to me, I don't think we serve our citizens any better with a, with a different name change, um, just as we do in organizations when we change people's titles. I don't think it changes their performance, although we, we use that sometimes. So um, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of it. Um, but I would say one thing to the public. We got a huge amount of email, and what I thought after about the 211th email, which I read them all, and a lot of them were cut and paste, um, was that I hope that everybody who is in support of the arts takes an opportunity to help us serve the rest of the community. There are tremendous opportunities for you to teach a painting class, to teach a photography class, to teach a yoga class. That happens. We teach lots and lots of classes, and we're constantly looking for people to do that. We, people know me as somewhat physically conservative, and what we do is we pay those teachers. Bruce pays those teachers for a yoga class or a painting class or whatever they're teaching, a, a ballroom dance class. And this is a great opportunity for people in the community who are interested in arts to volunteer to teach those classes, and that then reduces the expenditures that the city has to go through. So I would hope that a portion of those 211 people will take the opportunity to join us to help, one, promote the arts, two, do something for your community, three, reduce the amount of expenditure that we have to go through as a city every year, and help Bruce Fletcher get some of those great services delivered. Anyone else? The thing that stuck with people was let's get to a vote, I think. So not seeing anyone else. All right. All in favor of the motion, which uh, I won't try and it, it was to change the name. Uh, but I don't know. Go ahead, Allie, the, the exact language of the motion again. Provide direction to the Parks and Rec Director to change the name from Parks and Recreation to Parks, Arts, and Recreation Department. All right. All in favor of that. Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Sorry. <laughs> All opposed, nay. 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 Okay, so that fails on a 4-3 vote. Okay. So now uh, Debbie said that there's more she wants to talk about. Benson, you're, you're sort of grabbing the microphone, so why don't, I don't know if you guys figure it out. I already did. I, that, my yeah, ask. I, I was going to, you know, Deputy Mayor um, mentioned her ask, and I would... Uh, concur with that. I think uh, 
you know, as everybody has shared uh, their, their feelings, I mean, again, I uh, certainly understand it, uh, and um, I certainly respect everybody's position on this. But the, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, so the, the key is um, the name is, you know, uh, obviously secondary in terms of uh, actions that we take as a council. And, again, I just harp back to what I've said earlier that when we look at the CIP, that we just, again, uh, look at it with different lenses. And I like what uh, Council Member Wiesentiner said. I think it's it's something that we can all be very active individually and, and corporately. And so um, that's really the important thing. And so that's, again, I want to support uh, the ask. So I want to tr um, ask staff a question here. So the ask is I wrote it down, and if I got it wrong, you, you feel free to correct me. But I, I heard um, uh, a staff update on MICA. I heard uh, the capital, project, capital list posted, the Arts Council to review the list, and the list to be made uh, available for both the public and the Arts Council to add to. And then finally, for the 1% for the arts spending uh, to be reviewed. So I, I, those are the things I heard. The, the suggestion, I, I, the question I have for staff is there's a process, uh, SEPA process, that MICA is going through, and I would separate that out from the others and just ask, is it appropriate for that the council to get an update on that at this point, or would that be um, somehow inappropriate because of the, the state of the process at this point? I'd, my, just to reiterate, my ask was to let us know when you can. It wasn't to say okay. that it needs Thank to be you. immediately. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's how I heard it framed. And so um, at this point, we don't have a definite date to share with you, and we can provide an update after conferring with um, our DSG staff who's handling it. Okay, so providing an update in the near future is Yes, in the near future. Um, on or before our next council meeting, regularly scheduled council meeting. Okay. Council, are you, so when you say on or before, you're imagining that it might be a, a memo coming out then? It could either be an email or a memo, or it could be in this next city manager's report, um, whatever Julie decides to do. But she does need to confer with um, Scott and his team in DSG. Okay. I would ask whatever it is, though, that it be broadly publicly available, because some of those vehicles, you know, unless we – posts her report online, which may or may not be appropriate. Not that there's anything secret, but, you know, it's not a formal document. So whatever that update is or whatever the vehicle is, that it be accessible broadly to the public. Okay. I would imagine there's no reason that would be a confidential or, you know, attorney-client privilege document. So it, it wasn't meant, but I meant occasionally. It was, sometimes there's been conversation that J Julie writes it in a very conversational way and I wouldn't want her to feel that she had to change the writing style of that, which I think is quite effective for its purposes, if it is to be a public document. That was only my point. Okay. Um, okay, so that one I wanted to understand a little bit from the staff perspective. These, the other uh, asks that you made felt um, uh, like there was no further information needed. It's just a matter of whether the council supports that or doesn't support that. So I'm essentially looking for council thumbs up, thumbs down or further discussion as to um, Debbie's other points, which were published the capital list, um, have the Arts Council, ask the Arts Council to review it, uh, and for both the Arts Council and the public to add to it if they so choose, and for staff to um, do a, a review of the 1% for the arts spending uh, and come back to the Council in some fashion with an update on that. Well, I said that I was happy to sit with them and do it or any other council member or community member to the extent that the rest of the council wants a public presentation on it, that's fine. But that wasn't one of the, that formal an outline was not the way I had communicated it. Okay. So any uh, objections to what Debbie's asked for? I mean, just ask it that way. I'm not seeing any shaking of the head no. I'd be supportive of that um, for sure. I think we should, as part of that communication, sort of set expectations so that I think sometimes we put things out there and say we'd love you to contribute to this and, and we set the expectation that um, their ideas will naturally become part of our list. So how we communicate that I think would be important. Okay. Seeing no objection, then let's call it done. Julie, you're all right with that? Is enough formality to the direction? 
Okay, very good. All right, that uh, gets us past that sticky wicket. Um, we'll move now. Everybody still ready to go? Uh, Agenda Bill 5266, Closing Criminal Justice Fund. Chip Porter. Good evening. Um, I have a short presentation. However, if you just want to cut to it, I'm happy just to cut to the chase and field questions. Hand out the money. <laughs> cut, cut to the chase, ask questions. Council? Cut to the chase. Do you want me to give a little background? I, can, can you give us the 60 second or two I'll do the very short. Please. I won't even cut to a slide. I think as much as anything for the public, for you the bet. public watching. That's a so public as noted in the agenda bill, uh, at the November 21st uh, council meeting last year, we were wrapping up, you were wrapping up your review of the 1718 preliminary budget. And one of the things that came out, Dan brought it up, it's a good question, regarding the criminal justice fund. Can we just use the fund balance in that fund and kind of fold into the general fund? I'm just paraphrasing here. And at the time, it was staff's understanding, it's been this way for years, that criminal justice sales tax has very specific strings attached to it, and it had a non-supplanting clause. Well, it turns out the legislature removed that clause back in 2010. No one knew about it. And we verified that. And what that means is we can take the fund balance, as well as the revenues and expenditures, and fold it into the general fund. And so that results and that's equals, when you look at one-time money, unreserved, available fund balance. There's a few reserves in there you still have to reserve. They have strings attached. But unreserved fund balance, $945,000. Plus you look at budgeted revenues and expenditures in 17 and 18. And there's a net revenue in each year. And add that all together, that's about $1.21 million that you can then apply or, or, or use to fund the police department budget in 17 and 18, thereby freeing up general purpose tax revenues that are currently budgeted uh, and, 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 and focused on funding the police department budget in 17 and 18. It frees up general purpose tax revenues which have no strings attached to them. You can then use that money to address your projected deficits in the general fund, $505,000, and the YFS fund, $344,000 as I recall. That's about 850 in total. And then there's still 360 some odd left over Okay, and what I noted in the agenda bill is you could, you don't have to decide tonight. I'm not asking you to decide tonight, but just as to give you food for thought, you could apply it to your I-90 loss of mobility litigation funding. You could, I mentioned the contingency fund is uh, below its target. We could get that up to its target. There's other one-time funding needs. As an example, the, the soil issue between the maintenance center and Honeywell property. We could finally just go and fix that as another example. And there's other one-time funding issues. And the idea, uh, as a reminder, we'll be coming back to the council on uh, April 17th with two agenda bills. One will be related to I-90 loss of mobility litigation funding. And I promised the council I'd show you what are the new revenue options, such as utility tax, as an example, uh, and what are the one-time funding sources that we still have over and above the $1 million that's currently committed. And I would include this 360 some odd thousand dollars that uh, would be freed up as a result of this closing the criminal justice fund to the general fund. And so we'll come back to you on April 17th to uh, look at that and make some decisions there. Also on April 17th, I would bring back a budget amending ordinance as part of the fourth quarter 2016 financial status report. That's when you would actually take uh, official action uh, that where we actually amend the budget. But your motion here, it's sorry, it's complex. <laughs> I made it as simple as I could. It's effectively saying you're closing the criminal justice fund, you're moving the 1718 budget over to the general fund, you're taking the fund balance in the criminal justice fund, a big chunk, chunk of it's going to the general fund, a piece of it's going to the technology and equipment fund uh, as reserves, um, and you're also freeing up general fund revenues to help balance the budget. Sorry, that was longer than 60 seconds. No, that was good, though. <laughs> that was good. Okay, questions for Chip? So so I, I don't remember the budget anymore, Chip, but did we have this Contra account actually formally in the budget? Uh, yes. So should we, in the motion, close out the Contra account as well? That, that, that would happen when I bring back this complex set of budget adjustments in April. I mean, 
I, I was hoping to effectively address it by saying using the general fund tax revenues that are freed up to uh, yeah. address the 18. That's my intent anyways. So when you, you come back later on, we'll just formally get rid of that contra account. Which it's gone. I understand from somewhere else that Julie was surprised that she, when she saw the contra account, I don't, forgot where I read that somewhere. but It's a very old school way of doing things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. So this question is actually as much for Chief Holmes as it is for you. Um, when we were going through the budget discussions, in a, in a conversation the chief and I were having, there is a position on, if I'm, I'm trying to dig into my memory, there's a position on your staff that is funded externally with regard to GSI <laughs> mapping, et cetera. In, let's say, take a practical example, in the case that there's an active shooter near the schools. Now, my understanding is that we have received funding for that head for this calendar year, which is 17 and we anticipate losing that funding in 18. I'm waiting to see if you know it. Yeah. yeah, okay. So um, one of the points that is in my mind is while there's no longer an issue of supplanting, there is still the issue of principle, which is this, these taxes were collected in the context of public safety. I would encourage us to consider whether or not there are going to be requirements in our 18 budget for public safety funding that we had not anticipated and whether or not we would want to carve off a portion of this in that case. So I, I was looking to you to nod and tell me, yes, this is a head that's only funded through 17, not funded in 18. And I guess one of the questions would be, if not now, then in the next couple of months, would that be a head you wanted us to fund next year? Okay, thank you. And for the record, Ed Holmes, your police chief. And what the deputy mayor is talking about is a critical incident mapping program, or CIMP, CIMP. And it's through the state, and it funds the mapping of, or pre-planning of, if there's an active shooter going into the public schools and mapping out where would uh, assets from other agencies come to meet us. So it's all the pre-planning. Where would we stage uh, the command post? Where would incoming units go? So we could pull up a map of Bellevue High School or of Renton High School, or and conversely, they could pull up a map of our schools. So the funding for that, it was funding for new schools, and it was funding for remodels, and that funding was getting really tight, so it was going to end, and then they extended it for one year, and I don't know the, la the latest as far as will it be extended yet again, or are we done done with that? So um, that's the status as far as I'm aware of that monies, and what it would cost to keep it updated, I don't know. We just have a you know the big remodel at the IMS, and we have the new school here. So I don't know what the costs would be associated with that, and I wish I had better data um, on what that would look like, but I don't know. To your point, are there is that or would another program need to be funded in 2018? Um, I don't have I don't have any set dollars in my mind that I'm preparing to come to the council and ask for that at this point. So I think I'm probably trying to, I would get ahead of myself if I tried to say, yes, I want to set aside 100000 or X number of dollars. I, I will say this council has always been really supportive of anything. Um, if I can make a strong case for something, and I'm sure school safety and whatnot, is, it ranks high up there in your mind as it does mine, um, then I would come and we'd have to find dollars somewhere. So I don't know, I'm a little hesitant to say, that I want to set aside dollars from That's this. That's fine. I really appreciate you asking that, though, because it's a it's a really important topic. If we get to a place where I, I feel like I need to make that ask, um, I'm, I'm confident we could come to an agreement on how that would work, but I don't have any dollars right now to or a set amount to ask for for right now. Yeah, and I apologize. Um, I didn't really mean to put you on the spot in terms of the specifics. I think it was as much the intent to raise the conversation mm -hmm. that we'd had and the potential need. And again, if this if these dollars were raised in the context of public safety. Let's be very conscious that in the event there's a need for additional public safety spending that we remember this moment. Yeah, thank you for that. Other questions? Seeing none, I'd, yeah, I would welcome a motion. Move to prepare a 2017-2018 budget amending ordinance to close the criminal justice fund. Moving the 2017-2018 budget to the general fund, 
the 34,697 U.S. Treasury Reserve to the Technology and Equipment Fund, the 79,437 JAG and 41,345 ENTF Reserves to the General Fund, and the 945,173 unreserved fund balance to the General Fund and to balance the General Fund and Youth and Family Services Fund budgets in 2018 using the 2017-2018 General Fund tax revenues. They'll be freed up by closing the Criminal Justice Fund. Someone. I missed the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is second. there a, All right, move to end second. A discussion. I'd like to speak to that much. <laughs> but first I have to understand. No, I, I, I think this is, I'm glad we were able to do that and appreciate um, finance figuring out all the various numbers that have to be moved around to make that happen. Jeff? Yeah, no, I'd like to thank Dan for coming up with this one. Um, and just remind us that there's always places and ways to save money, little and big. This happens to be a big, so I hope we're all as, as vigilant as Dan was on this one in a bunch of areas that we can make sure we have our finances as short up as they possibly can be. Anyone else? I will just add, um, and Chip, I'll probably be echoing what you might say on this, but one-time money. This is one-time money, and it does it's, it fills a hole for us, and that is a is a very good thing. Uh, solves a number of problems. Doesn't solve us. Doesn't give us any ongoing benefit beyond that. So we just we just need to recognize that it's, it actually does give us an ongoing benefit. It, it's because that sales tax keeps coming year after year. It's a one half percent. So it's every year it does, but we're that, putting that came regardless every year. And, right, but it always was going. It was just building up this fund. So now that okay. becomes. Available. About 130000 a year. So there is a little bit of benefit. I stand corrected. Thank you. All right. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we move to code uh, agenda bill 5270, code amendment adopting MICC chapter 3.04 pertaining to indemnification of city employees and officials. First reading. Welcome, Carrie. Good evening, Mayor Bassett, Deputy Mayor Bertland, and members of the council. I'm going to follow our finance director, Chip Quarters' lead, and give you the 60 second overview of this. So, as most of you are aware, um, my awareness of the lack of code provisions relating to indemnification of city employees elected officials and volunteers um, became known when I was working on our new city manager's contract. And as my agenda bill states, RCW 4.96.041 contemplates that there will be procedures adopted by ordinance or resolution for indemnification of employees, elected officials, and volunteers. So um, I've listed 31 other King County cities that have such provisions consistent with state law. Um, just to assure everyone, the protections have been in place as part of common law and through our membership with the WCIA risk pool. So it's not that they haven't been provided to date, but we just wanted to formally adopt it and make it part of our code. Um, it's the best practice. So that's why it's recommended now. Um, of these 31 cities listed in the agenda bill, about 18 of those are WCIA member cities that are in our same risk pool. And um, I just strongly recommend that the council consider adopting this. I also wanted to let the council know that since publishing of the packet last week, I have received comments from various council members suggesting some minor wordsmithing and tweaks to those, and I'm happy to pull those up on the screen and we can review them. But um, frankly, I view them as um, refinements. I wouldn't say they're um, non-substantive changes. I think some of them are substantive and do add value, but um, they are refinements. Would you like to have me go over those, or would you like to see those um, simply carried forward to second reading? I do have hard copies um, on the dies for your review, and they are marked in track changes for your ease of reference. House members, you want to review them? I'm not seeing that we... Does the council have any that. any questions that I can answer about this? Okay, Benson? Um, Carrie, yeah, I, I sent you this question earlier. I mean, it's really on that uh, proviso in that last sentence in section 
3.04.030C. I, I was just curious the reasoning for that proviso in the last sentence. Since, yep, go ahead. Well, for everyone's benefit, I was just going to read the sentence um, that Council Member Wong is proposing to delete. Well, it's not a deletion. Is that right? It's just an, an, I wanted an explanation why it was even why it wasn't necessary. So. I think your question was a good one, and I gave it some thought. And um, I think it would be such a rare instance where it would even come up that, like you, I started to question the utility of keeping it there. So the sentence at issue is sure, on. Could you yeah just read? Yeah, it's on Exhibit first. One, mm -hmm. page five of your packet. And if you go to page five of exhibit one, I would say um, it is halfway down the page right before the bolded heading for section 3.04.040 exclusions. And that statement reads, the officer, employee, or volunteer shall be liable for all hourly charges in excess of said rate. And the rate that's being referenced here is the hourly rate established by the city's contract with any outside council hired for purposes of providing a defense. So when we contract with outside council, we do agree to uh, an hourly rate. Um, we typically don't agree to any kind of range of rates with a high, low, and something in the middle, and something even higher than that. We would never agree to pay higher than the negotiated rate. So the more I thought through Councilmember Wong's comment there, you know, I really tended to agree with him that I don't know that that sentence is, is serving a, a great purpose other than obviously it is trying to anticipate a potential scenario and trying to guard against that happening. But if the council sees value in it, we'll keep it. And um, if I'm getting some sort of majority thumbs up tonight indicating go ahead and delete it, then you will not see it carried forward for second reading. So um, maybe Benson, you want to start with your thoughts on this? Yeah. I, again, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Carrie. Uh, I, I just thought that uh, in this situation, it's a city that enters into these contracts, and so the dollar right dollar amount that we would pay these attorneys uh, are presumably set. And so I just did not understand this proviso and this idea that in the event the amount payable to the outside attorney exceeds the contract amount, then the elected official, the employee, the you know, whoever would be liable for the excess amount. It just didn't make any sense to me because uh, it's a city that actually is one who's in control of the amount paid to the attorney. So that was the rationale. So it may, let me just ask a question. So uh, is this trying to address a situation where the employee uh, says, well, I don't want to use the city's attorney. I want to use uh, a different, much higher priced attorney. And the, the employee then is becoming liable for the difference in cost? No, um, that scenario that you've just described is actually addressed on page seven of exhibit one in um, 3.04.080. Okay. And that's where it talks about if you as an employee, elected official, or volunteer elect to provide your own high-powered attorney with respect to representation in, in your defense, then you are not covered by the protections of this chapter. You're on your own. Okay. So, so it's, it's, that's what that says. Going back to clarifying the, the statement that Benson's calling into question, um, that's basically saying, hey, if we negotiate an hourly rate of $500 an hour, and for whatever reason the invoice comes back to us at $600 an hour, we're not paying that additional $100 an hour. Is that clear? Okay. And we just think that's, I mean, thinking about it more, I think that's a pretty unlikely scenario. Um, but frankly, because I had 31 cities to look at for comparator model ordinances, if you will, um, I just looked at a combination of, of them and picked the ones I thought were the best and just basically put them in here thinking, you know, every single sentence would be great for us, but we do need to drill down deeper than that and look at it more critically and carefully for our purposes here. And, um, you know, having done that, Council Member Wong obviously 
looked at it very carefully, he questioned that, and I agree with that. So my recommendation, consistent with his, he prompted it, would be to go ahead and delete that sentence. Okay. Dan. You know, I, I, if, I think what someone was trying to get to when they may have written that in another context was the problem of who's directing the, count, the lawyer to do what. So where you often get into a mess is a situation where, you know, say I was the one being indemnified and for whatever reason we hired you know, a lawyer to do it and I start telling the lawyer what to do rather than the city telling the lawyer what to do, which I can't imagine that would happen. <laughs> but, but just on the off possibility that I say, I think you should go file this motion and the city says, I think, no, I don't want to spend the money on filing that motion. I, I think that's probably what it's trying to get at rather than than the question of the hourly rate. I think it's 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 it I think what you probably want to say that it is in this that that even if outside counsel is hired, it's still the city that's directing the defense of the directing the defense and not the the individual since the city's gonna be picking up the judgment if 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 we lose. What I hear you saying, Councilmember Grouse, is the issue isn't as much having an hourly rate that's in excess of the negotiated rate as perhaps um, scope creep and having the scope of work perhaps creep I, beyond um, defense. So, for example, if no, no, you were no. being defended and then suddenly you wanted to bring counterclaims no, and I, we were I, I like, think, well... I think, it, I think what you want a statement in there is saying that notwithstanding the, the selection of outside counsel, the city still controls the defense of the, of the matter. So make it clear that it's not the individual, it's the city that controls the defense of the matter. And, and then I think that then uh, you, you won't have any issues. You just want to get out of that situation where the person says, uh -huh, now I can tell the lawyer what to file, what not to file, and, and then puts the city in the position of potentially having to pay a judgment they shouldn't have paid because the lawyer does something. So I think, that's, I think you just want to come up with a sentence saying who directs the defense in that situation. I can certainly do that if that's the will of a majority of the council. Is there support for that on the council? Looking for a thumbs up. Got it. Okay. Okay. Anything else, council? Okay, I'm looking for a motion then. So we're just going to second reading. Um, you still have to make a motion. Thank you. I move to set ordinance number 117C-08 to April 3rd, 2017 for second reading. And I thank you very much, Carrie, for bringing this to our attention and getting it done. Is that part of the motion? Second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moved and second. We'll take just the first part of that as the motion. Uh, discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Carrie, thank you very much. And, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for uh, alerting us to this in the first place. So. Okay, we move now, I keep losing my front page here this evening. We move now to other business. Um, so council member absences, we have none this evening. Planning schedule, Julie? Sorry. So this evening you might recall we originally had a study session for your council rules of procedure given all the other important work items on your plate, it looks like we aren't able to schedule that until June 5th. So just wanted to point that out. It's a bit later than I would have liked, but I think given everything on our plate, it, it, that is just when you are um, available, when you have a study session available. Um, but again, I'll make sure you have a memo in advance so you're not caught off guard on what we're proposing on some of that. Um, so I wanted to bring that to your attention and um, just really see if you had any questions. Oh, and I am bringing back study session as well. I'm excited about this, but your council goals on April 17th. So wanted to note that one as well. Okay, questions, Debbie? Yeah, I have a question. I'm guesstimating that it's a, a typo in here. If you go to the final page with the first date being July 3rd, 
which I'd call out is also a Monday before the 4th of July, so if people are planning a four-day weekend, that could get sticky. But it goes July 3rd, July 17th, and then the third one is June 19th, and then it goes to August 7th. So I think we ended up with just an extra. You win the prize. Chunk in there. Oh, good job. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'm realizing the July 3rd piece, and then at some point I'm going to point out that I'm probably going to be gone July 17th, and I'm going to take a heart Sharp look to the right and see if Dave's going to be at MGX. Or it's called oh. Ready this year. Or not. But anyway. Well, I won't be ready, but I'll be at Ready. Okay. Ditto. Ready. What do we do about this? I'll be at the Ready. So July 3rd is probably not a meeting date. And July 17 is a date we will either be at 5 or we'll think about maybe moving. Well, okay. I guess it's a question of the 4th of July is the day we legally have off. I think it's a question of whether or not there's going to be a quorum of you here on the 3rd. So July 3rd is a, is a Monday. Monday. July 4th is a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. The official holiday is the 4th, the Tuesday. Right. Okay. So is the, does the council want to talk about these dates with your calendars right now? or Well, can we just do a, a, some sort of doodle pool or whatever it's called to... Is that what it's called? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just to figure out dates, because we need to have July meetings. We're already going to cancel yeah. one August meeting. And I also want to point out that in terms of the timing of the expiration of our moratoria, that we've got reason to meet in order to get the work done that we created a moratoria to provide the opportunity to get that work done. So I support Dan's suggestion. So would would be his staff... Take a look at the calendar and come up with what you think is a best set of options, and yeah, then which, float which, them out to us as a as a doodle poll. Okay. We'll which may not be Mondays. I mean, it, given what you got, it may have to be a different day of the week. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else so on nice the planning? Do Julie, uh, calendar, yeah. calendar schedule. Chip mentioned that he's coming back in April on the altern the funding for the I ninety litigation. I didn't. Is that part of one of these April fourth, third, or April seventeenth agendas? I wasn't sure. wasn't clear to me where that was. I think it is on April seventeenth as part of the budget adjustments with that. With that, your fourth quarter. Yeah, my guess is that's going to take more than thirty minutes. If that's that's going to be a longer discussion. If we're talking about tax increases. Yeah, sure. It'll be what it is. <laughs> It looks, it looks like we've got some pretty big meetings coming up yeah. in April, though. So. Um, well, you have funding at the bottom of that. Do you see that, Councilmember Grouse? Oh, the, I see that litigation funding. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. I should try to read right. the I whole like, thing. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else on the planning schedule? Uh, just a question. We do have the meeting with the school board on April 20th. Do we have a general sense of what the agenda is going to be, or is that going to be coming out pretty soon? No, Very we soon. Tomorrow. We have tomorrow morning. We have a meeting with the uh, 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 director and uh, we're su the superintendent. And right, and we'll be looking to finalize that. Um, but it's probably looking like the interlocal agreement regarding fields um, will be your top as a FYI topic, but I don't know if there were any other in particular. Honestly, I don't recall. There were a number of things, but n not anything that was too heavy. Um, I, I would be interested in getting another update on the um, cameras, the school bus. Oh, okay. Cameras. Um, I'd also be interested, that, you know, they did pass, uh, I don't remember if it was a bond or a levy, and I know they have a number of projects capital projects that they're driving over the next few years. It would be great to to see what those are and, you know, A, out of curiosity, I admit, but B, equally to see what synergies there might be uh, with the city. I guess that's a good point. Are there <laughs> any particular agenda items that you would like to see addressed at the joint meeting? Well, I think McCleary is going to be a big one to get an update from them. Okay hear about the report that Tom Acker brought for the demographic yeah. study. I that, that was actually one of the items. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Uh, then uh, board appointments, we have none, but I think, Allie, we are, you've put out the notice that we're looking for folks to fill a, a 
board positions in the coming year, right? Yeah, we're in the middle of our annual recruitment, so um, there are positions on, I think, every board right now that we are looking for, except for the library board. And um, information's on the website. If you need a copy of an application, let me know. Um, we're just trying to reach as many people as possible. Excellent. Thank you. Council member reports. Benson, you want to begin? Yeah. Um, on March 9, uh, King County Executive Dal Constantine introduced a ordinance uh, regarding the possible placement, and I think it's going to be in August, <clears throat> excuse me, August 2017, of a cultural access sales tax. It's uh, one tenth of one percent, so basically equates to one cent for every dollar spent, so it's a sales tax. But the purpose of it was to raise money um, for future grants. Uh, to promote uh, cultural and arts, fine arts, and other um, programs. So that's uh, that. I'll come to the voters presumably in August, and so uh, something to look out for, I guess. Um, then I guess I just wanted to mention that also on that same day, I attended a uh, reception at the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they basically uh, paid tribute, of course, to Terry Mormon and her 26 years of service. It was well attended. Uh, I think um, uh, a number of community members and also uh, it was basically put on not only by the staff of the chamber, but I think from obviously a uh, former city council person, uh, Jane Braun, was you know, instrumental in that. And then I have to do the shout out because I know Wendy is, it will be uh, too, too uh, modest to do that, but her um, uh, daughter did a great job as an MC at uh, this uh, community conversation that we had. Uh, kudos to Cindy Goodwin for um, and the folks at YFS for putting this on. Uh, basically, it was a conversation that uh, uh, with with parents, community, uh, asking questions of some of uh, experts in connection with um, parenting and uh, basically how to improve the conversation dialogue that parents have with with uh, young people. So that was actually very well attended. About 70 people uh, showed up, and then. Uh, lastly, uh, I have to mention this. I know uh, Bruce mentioned the, the uh, Rotary, uh, the uh, half marathon. I would just like to say that uh, while I was struggling, uh, I happened to listen to two uh, uh, women runners who were going past me as we were going up a hill. And it was just, uh, what they said was just remarkable because it really um, shows how Bruce Isle can, can put on a good face. They basically said, did you hear that person behind us? Uh, and they were talking about this um, uh, volunteer who was handing out water. And basically, uh, they were saying, she said, thank you to us for running. Isn't that remarkable? And so uh, anyway, it was just a really a nice comment to hear about the, the island. So anyway, that's, that's that. I just have to interject. It would have been distressing to me to be running up a hill to have two women go by me talking while they were running. <laughs> <laughs> it would have just been the nail in the coffin of my becoming old and decrepit, I think. so. Benson, did you win? Um, when I checked, I finished six in my age group. Nice. Very nice. Wow. Out of six. <laughs> six of six. That's... Wendy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that also goes to the, you know, the, the, the line. I don't know what movie it was in, the, the line. I didn't know they gave ribbons out all the way to 12th place. You know? <laughs> so, anyway, sorry. Uh, so I want to hand it to Julie for her presentation of the East Side Transportation Association last week. Well done. Um, it was an interesting dialogue. Always good to hear um, different perspectives. I also attended the East Side Transportation Partnership meeting the Friday before. That was really useful to get updates, and I sent you all an email with that information. Um, and then the third thing I wanted to mention was the East Side Human Services Forum, where the city is a member already, and our staff, Cindy Goodwin, the director, does a lot of work at the work group level. I'm going to be trying to support her there and, and have our city representation there at their board meetings and maybe the work group level going forward. Great. Jeff? Yes. Debbie? Um, Thursday, March 9th, I was at the JCC. They were um, having a follow-up meeting, and we had a tremendous showing from Chief Holmes and his staff. The conversation was safety and everything that goes on, not only on a daily basis, 
but in terms of the strategy and the importance of, of keeping our community partner at the J safe and, and sound. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm almost speechless because it was a very, very intense meeting to be in that room with people who are acknowledging that every single day there is a concern about a physical attack. But the most important part was the appreciation and the thanks for our police department was very clear. And um, it was Chief Holmes who had his little video that was there. That was very good. Um, commentary from the chief detective involved who'd been in meetings with the FBI, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, my, my deepest appreciation for the J and everything they're going through and um, ongoing commitment, at least on behalf of myself, to continuing to support not only their safety, but a culture of tolerance and acceptance in this community. Dan? So a few things. I was at the um, RPC Regional Policy Committee meeting um, where the probably the, the most time was spent on the on the um, arts levy that um, the arts levy that it okay the most time was spent on the arts levy that uh, that Ben's had already mentioned. Um, it's it's a very it's interesting because. Um, Sound Cities has not taken a formal position on the levy, and, and I'm not sure what the position would be if, if um, it actually was came to a vote of Sound Cities, listening to some of the discussion, particularly from South County, um, which, uh, I mean, their, their feeling is that it's, the money goes to Seattle, and because and, it, it, it's very difficult. It, the, what makes it this levy interesting is that the state law is very very specific on how the money has to be spent. Exactly, you have to spend seventy percent of the money, for example, on regional arts organizations. So that's actually mandated by state law. And a regional arts organization, the way the the county has defined it, is basically an arts organization which has a revenues of at least three million dollars. So, by definition, you start off with large arts organizations getting 70% of the money. And then it turns around and says, well, they got to spend a certain part of that money to support school children being able to come up and, and go to the arts organizations. So you, they have to give like free, free tickets to school children. But also what's not recognized is that the way they define a regional arts organization, it includes the zoo, the aquarium, and, and other activities which you might not normally associate with with arts so and and even conflict even make it more specific what what it basically says is you the county has to rank the arts organizations using very specific variables like revenues and attendance and then based upon those variables that's how you allocate the money so there's no discretion it's not like you apply for the money and, and you get um, well, because you've got the best program that you're putting forward, you're going to get the money this year. It's it's a very formulaic um, levy, so it's it's not necessarily what people would would have would have expected on this. So I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what the county council does with it. They have to decide within the next two months whether to put it on the ballot because they want to run it on the August ballot. And that's another interesting thing. The, under state law, unless the county puts it on the ballot now, it would open the door for Seattle to do their own levy. And so basically the county's trying to jump in here to keep Seattle from doing its own levy. And it's and it, so if, if so if the county doesn't act by a certain date, then cities over a certain size can go in and I think even Mercer Island could do our own levy if we wanted to. So it, it but it, if so the county has to act by a certain date to prevent the cities from coming in and doing their own levies. So it's a very interesting state law. That there's a very, there's a sim, at the same time the state did this one, they also did another one for something, it's a public safety type thing, I think. Or, no, it's a housing levy. There's, a, there's another one that could, that has a, uh, there's another tenth of a percent sales tax on for a housing levy, which will, what the, the executive's office told the RPC was that That'll be next up, but probably not till later in the year. So that that's coming next. Um, 
I was also at the uh, JRC meeting, which deals with housing issues. Um, we're in the middle of trying to come up with a new agreement, which will come back to the city council on the relationship between JRC and the city council. It's this huge interlocal agreement. Um, so that's I have gone to a couple meetings on that now, and it's still in the formative stages. Uh, um, Joint Resources Committee. It, it just basically is a. It takes federal grant dollars and is the body which allocates the federal grant dollars for community block grants and various housing programs and allocates it around allocates it around the region. It gives a fair chunk of change to Arch, for example, mm -hmm. and, and other types of housing projects. Um, and finally, I went to on, on Saturday. I went to the um, the town hall meeting that uh, Judy, Tana, and Lisa put on. And uh, as I think I've already told Bruce, it was unbelievably refreshing to have a meeting that I-90 was not the main topic of discussion. And, and that there was a very, very um, engaged community talk, wanting to talk about education and mental health and other critical issues that um, sometimes we lose track of. Um, and because of other pressing issues, but um, I think all three of our legislators did a really excellent job. We're very well received, and um, we're very showed a, a lot of um, knowledge on on these issues, which are ultimately of critical importance to the state. Thank you, Dave. Okay, mine will not be nearly that detailed. Uh, open Space Conservancy meeting. Uh, two things learned a lot about uh, root rot. And we have a significant amount of root rot in uh, in our parks, so it's 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 funny to talk about, but it, it's actually a fairly serious threat to um, a lot of our big trees, and it's a, a awfully tough thing to contain. So that's one thing. Know about root rot. Two, uh, leap for green this year is on April first, so mark your calendars for that. And that is the end of my story. All right, mine's even shorter. I have been traveling and uh, have no report. So, okay, with that, we are going to return to executive session. Um, I'm going to say that we're going to start at 9, give you guys, everybody, a, a brief break here. And um, what more do I need to do to – I'm sorry? Duration. Set the duration. Um, one hour. Ten minutes. One hour. One hour and ten minutes. One hour. So beginning at 9. Anything else I need to do at this point? All right. Seeing none, we're, we're in recess then until 9 o'clock, and, and then we'll start up with the executive session. Thank you.